Hi, welcome to the Sigma Path. In this episode, we're going to try another repair. This is an HP 83752A. This is a 10 MHz to 20 GHz synthesized sweeper. I actually have one of these in the lab already, and we've done quite a few experiments with it. The sweeping function is very handy. Its phase noise is not the greatest. It's a fairly old unit, but nonetheless, it is quite uh, useful to have one in the lab. So if you can have two in the lab, why not? So we're going to try and see what's wrong with it. I've already plugged it in, and there is absolutely nothing. There is no standby light or anything else it basically doesn't do anything so obviously there is a power supply problem we have to address first and then we're going to check to see if there are any other issues maybe something with the RF that we can also play around with and here's what's inside of the unit from the top I already took a cover that was blocking this area as well multiple boards in there as it is classic design from HP the big motherboard in the back connects everything together so synthesizers and various analog and digital stuff is all going to be over here a lot of the RF stuff's there as you can see from the piping at the top of this unit and this fan blows across its entire section now here's the power supply it is very very large and has a ribbon cable coming out of it i should say individual cables coming out clearly mo making a lot of different voltages to make all the devices here run now since there is no standby uh, light or anything this power supply is essentially doing nothing so it's not like one of its power supply is missing i don't think it's doing anything at all so we should check that of course and then we'll dig into this if there is any other problem now this cover over here even has the cpu error codes and everything written to it isn't that amazing? I mean, this, the way these uh, HP engineers used to help you debug this, it was amazing. Of course, things have changed a lot since then. We don't do component level replacements anymore at these companies. They just throw away the boards. But we want to dig into it and figure out what's wrong with it one step at a time. And here's the power supply. It is fairly complex. It's got two main PCBs. This PCB sits on top of this one and the entire thing is in an enclosure. It's very difficult to work on it like this, so it's better to take it out and examine it like this. Of course, you have to be very careful. This is connected to an isolation transformer. I'll show you that in just a second. Now, we're not going to dig into every single step of this because most likely the primary switcher of this thing isn't even working. Otherwise, we'll get some life at least in some places. So we'll go one step at a time. Then the front end over here, we have some protection and we do seem to have some power factor correction circuitry some rectifiers are the main capacitors obviously going in and then we have our first switcher over here and this this piece this wire over here actually plugs in to this side and i think this is already a rectified output of the first switcher feeding in there so this should work even without this we should be able to get something from this portion of the circuit so we're going to leave this one for a little bit later and then all the outputs are on this one so this does further switching to create all the different power supplies so let's take it one step at a time. I've identified a couple of components here worth looking at. So this chip over here is a PWM controller. This is a TI part. And this is what you would expect to find because you would need some first switching stage to get everything started. So we should make our measurements from here. And there's some comparators and some further stuff over here. And this entire board, of course, is going to have more switching on it. Now, there is a cable also from going from this side to here. I've bypassed it using some cables just outside of your viewing area over there. So we can close that loop. So everything else is connected like it is when it's closed in, except for this main rectified output, I believe. So let's turn it on and see what we get. All right, let's apply the full 120 volt to this. All right, so we do see something. So this light over here, I believe, means that the rectified output is actually present here. So now you've got to be quite careful because you have a large voltage DC sitting around in different places. Now I want to check the power supply of this PWM controller because if the power supply is not present, this is not going to do anything. And this is often an issue with switching power supplies. In order to get the PWM process started, you need to have some initial power. I believe this capacitor here is responsible for stabilizing the voltage to this. And, and if this capacitor is bad, you're not going to get the right voltage at this. Let's measure that and see what it looks like. All right, let's use the multimeter we fixed in the previous video so we can get good use out of this. So according to the data sheet, this thing is supposed to have a power supply of minimum 12 volts. And I think maximum is 24 volts or so. So you got to be quite careful here. Let's measure the power supply. What do we have? Oh, 8 volts. Okay, so it's not at its minimum. Now, 8 is high enough that sometimes they do start, but this seems to be a little bit lower than I was expecting. So let's take a look at the capacitor just to make sure that capacitor is not the problem. All right, let's use the Sencor LC103 from one of the previous videos to check this capacitor. Here it is. I've connected it and I entered the information. You can see it is a 100 microfarad 50 volt capacitor. Let's try and measure the capacitance value. It says 25 microfarad. Well, that's definitely not correct. Let's try the ESR. Ooh, 68 ohms. Yeah, that is definitely a bad capacitor. We can also measure its leakage and see what it does. 
No, wait, that's not bad. 154 kilo ohm, not too bad. So it just has a really bad ESR. It doesn't seem to be leaking so much. Okay, let's replace it. All right, I replaced it. I also replaced this other one as well. And this one was already good actually, but this, as you saw, was bad. All right, let's go ahead and measure that and see what we get. I'm gonna enable the power again. Okay, there we go. And let's see if the power supply voltage on that node has changed, which would be a, a good sign. From here, and carefully there. Ah, look at that, 12.5. So it did change. That's a good sign. Oh, you know what? I just realized something. I was just looking, and I don't know if you can tell or not, but these lights are now on. They were not on before. That's great. So something has definitely changed. I think I'm going to close this up because it's in standby now, and in order for it to be pushed into operation, it needs to be inside the unit. So we've taken a step forward. Okay, the power supply has been reinstalled. I already see one light here, and according to that light, that is the standby light, which makes sense. All right, let's power it on. We should see some more activity. There it is. Ah, look at that. That looks good. That's beautiful. I see a bunch of blinking lights over here. All the power supplies are there. But you know what? I hear nothing. Ah, uh, this fan is dead. Oh God, it started. It's making hor horrible noises. All right, we're gonna address this, this fan before we can go on. The original fan was completely destroyed. The bearings were rusted and gone. So I just made a new one. We can install this one. Okay, time to do some more testing on this guy. Let's see what we have. So it does seem to boot at least initially correctly, so it does have the ROM, it checks its CPU first, and if that doesn't work, of course, nothing else can happen. Initially firmware, pretty good. There we go, I think it's in sweep mode. Oh, I see problems already. That's unfortunate. So we have an unlock condition, and we have an unlevel condition occasionally. So it's in sweep mode going from 10 to 20 gigahertz. I guess that's the preset condition. Let me try that again. Yep, that's the preset condition. That's unfortunate. Well, let's uh, put it into CW mode. That's at 10 gigahertz. So we still have the unlock condition. Let's go to one gigahertz. Still has unlocked, unfortunately. 10 gigahertz, still unlocked. 20 gigahertz, uh, it's still unlocked. Interesting that the on level doesn't show up in this situation. I wonder why that is. It must be showing up because at some point during the sweep, it is producing that condition. Let's preset it again. Okay, well, generally speaking, in situations where you have an unlock and an unlevel condition, you must almost always address the unlock condition because when the PLLs of a system like this are not locked, you don't have the correct tone appearing at the right time. The mixers that heterodyne and generate the upper frequencies may not be present because the PLL is unlocked, and so then you trigger an unlevel condition because of that. So we should be chasing the unlock condition. Let's dig in a little bit further. So let's go ahead and take a look at the output of this synthesizer on our Signal Hound SM200C. This is a fantastic spectrum analyzer, real time with optical interface, and it, tra and it sweeps at 8 terahertz per second. So it's great for catching these infrequent events. It is also a 20 gigahertz instrument. I've done a full teardown and review of this. So let's take a look. Okay, so here we have the instrument sweeping. We're going from 10 megahertz all the way to 20 gigahertz with equal steps. I have set the sweep time to be equal to 2 seconds. So yeah, looks good. It seems to be jumping between the equal steps as expected. So I'm not sure why it is giving us that unlevel condition. Let's try a couple of individual frequencies. I'm going to go into CW. So here's the center frequency. That seems to be spot on. Look at that. Let's put the center frequency at 10 gig. And let's lower the span a bit. Let's say 200 megahertz. I mean, it looks fine. The phase noise looks reasonable. So I'm not sure why it's complaining. Let's go to 15 gigahertz. It should be probably still okay, if it's okay, that, yeah, looks good. So maybe at the upper, upper end of the frequency, here's 20 gigahertz. We can try 20 gigahertz. No, it's all good. So the difference between this frequency and the frequency of the instrument obviously has to do with the difference frequency of the crystals that these two instruments are using. They're not locked to each other. But if this PLL was unlocked, you would see it. Let's zoom in further just to really make sure no, it's, it's stable. This is a locked PLL. You can even see the, the shape of the phase noise through the PLL. So I don't understand what's wrong with it. It seems to be complaining about something. Okay, well, let's try 5 gigahertz. 5 gigahertz. Still looks good. Yep, still seems locked. 
Let's try uh, 1 gigahertz at the low end frequency as well, just to make sure. Here's 1 gigahertz. And then we go to 1 gigahertz. Oh, look at that. Okay, so there is a problem. Now, this is indeed an unlocked PLL. And it looks like it is hunting for it between these two extreme ends, which must represent some tuning somewhere. So it's unable to tune it. You can see how fast it's trying. That's to do with the PLL bandwidth. And this, this uh, signal hand, of course, can catch that because it is doing some uh, extremely fast sampling. This is not even in real time. Okay, so that's not working. That is interesting. Let's increase the span. Oh, yeah, it's completely unlocked. So let's go up in frequency a little bit and see if it starts working at some point. Two, three, four. Here's 1.5 gigahertz. Okay, let me set the span to 2 gigahertz. Keep going up. 1.5. 6, 7, 8, 9, still doesn't work. Oh, there it is. Exactly at 2 gigahertz, it starts working. Okay, we already have made a lot of useful observations. So if we go 1.9995, ah, it doesn't work. And if I go 2.0 exactly, it starts working. And if I go above 2, it seems to work just fine. Okay, so we have lots of information. So the amplitude is correct, that's important. So there's nothing wrong with the ALC, there's nothing wrong with the circuits responsible for producing our output. But below 2 gigahertz, all of a sudden it doesn't work and it keeps hunting for a signal. Now we can go lower, here is 500, let's put it at 500 meg, yeah, so it still doesn't work, okay. So the span is a bit wider here, okay, interesting, so it doesn't work at 500, 400 still doesn't work. And let's just do for completion 100 as well. And yep, it still doesn't work. Okay, so we have lots of information now. Amplitude is okay. It's hunting for PLL lock below 2 gigahertz. Now it's time to look at the block diagram of the instrument, take this information and see if we can debug it. So here's the overall block diagram of this instrument. Now there's obviously a lot going on. But what I've done is I've written down what we observed during the measurement. Now we saw that above 2 gigahertz, the amplitude was okay and the frequency was okay. So essentially above 2 gigahertz, the instrument is working. Now below 2 gigahertz, the amplitude was okay, but the frequency was not. And the frequency was hunting within a couple of hundred megahertz from where it should be. So it did track within that 2 gigahertz bandwidth, but it wouldn't stay stationary at a particular frequency, it would jump back and forth, which is an unlock condition for a PLL. But that distinction actually matters a lot. So we'll talk about that. Let's go ahead and zoom in a little bit and see what this instrument looks like. I'm going to have to find a way to navigate this a little bit. So let's start from the output over here. Now in the output, things are okay because we are seeing the frequencies above 20 gigahertz, so I'm not too worried about that section. So there is a mechanical attenuator. I actually don't have this option enabled on this instrument. The very first thing we see, there's an ALC. This ALC is going to detect the output signal amplitude, and this symbol of a detector there, and that's going to adjust various attenuation and ampli amplification stages in order to give you a constant known value output power. This is normal, all of the synthesizers need this. And that signal comes over here, and you can see that it has some integrator and some detections over there. And then depending on the band, it's going to control either this path's attenuators or this path's attenuators. But that part is working because all the amplitude is correct. Now even though it does say unlevel sometimes, I think that's because when it's hunting below 2 gigahertz, it's shifting around so much that the ALC just can't keep up. So it thinks that the signal is unlevel, but in reality it's not. So we're going to ignore that. I don't think that's an issue. Now we do have a filter over here, which is interesting. So they actually have a Yik Tune filter too to really clean it up. So this should have pretty good harmonic. We'll take a look at it if we can fix it. Now if you go over here, you can see that between 2 to 20 gigahertz, that signal is coming from this path. Now between 2 to 20 gigahertz, this instrument is essentially working. So I don't think that's the problem, which means if you follow this path a little bit more, we should see all the blocks that are, that are actually in reality fully functional. So let's see where that comes from. So we have an amplifier that's obviously working, LC is working, and there is a high and a low band within this section also, which means that that's, that itself is broken into two. And if you go a little bit further back, that becomes clear. There's actually two YIG tune oscillators in here, one from 2 to 11, another one from 11 to 20. So this DYO section, this modulation amplification section, that's fully functional because we do see 2 to 20 gigahertz without any issues. So all of that is fine. Now this also has some other important consequences. 
it means that this sampler is working because this sampler is looking at the signals between 2 to 20 it's a kind of like a mixer and it down converts it with a known frequency coming from a different block in order to be able to close the loop around the yik tone oscillator so there's a big PLL that wraps around this entire section and we can see where that is coming from you see that this PLL loop is like this but this sampler needs a frequency in order to do the down conversion and that's coming from this fractional end synthesizer now take a look and see where the reference for that is coming from. There's a 2 MHz reference, okay? So let's keep that in mind. There's a 2 MHz reference that goes into the fractional end sampler, then it goes into the sampler, then it goes into the yig loop, and it closes the loop around this. So this entire section, including the driver of the yig, all have to be fully functional in order for the 2 to 20 GHz section of this instrument to work. This is a huge help because it means a lot of these things are perfectly fine and there are interdependencies between these blocks. So if this is working, that means some other stuff must also be working. Okay, so let's step back a little bit and take a look at the part of this that's not working. And we can see that we have a heterodyne band and this heterodyne band is the part that produces the signals that are going between 2 to 20. You can see the output of this heterodyne and right over here, you can see it's labeled from 10 megahertz to 2 gigahertz. So this part, this is the signal that has the problem. Now, where does that signal go? Well, it goes over here, and it goes into a switch, and it makes its way to the output. So we don't have to worry about this part, because this part is obviously still working, and the signal is making it to the output, so that part is also okay. If you step back, this amplifier must be working, because we do get the correct amplitude, just not the right frequency. Now, take a look and see how that signal below 2 gigahertz is actually created. It is created via a down conversion stage. So there's a mixer over here. The input to that mixer is a 5.4 to 7.4 gigahertz signal. Where is that signal coming from? Well, that's coming from here. We know that that one's working. So this is why that frequency within the 2 gigahertz is tunable. It's tunable because this path is fully functional. And that's pretty important too. And we know this path is functional because the stuff above 2 gigahertz works. Okay? So we can put a check mark in here. This is most likely working. This amplifier is okay. This mixer must be okay because if it weren't okay, you wouldn't have the signal mixing in. Now, how are they generating below 2 gigahertz? Well, they have a synthesizer here. That synthesizer is fixed at 5.4 gigahertz. So when 5.4 gigahertz mixes with 5.41, you get 10 meg. That's the lowest frequency this synthesizer can produce. And when 5.4 gigahertz mixes with the 7.4, you get 2 gigahertz. And that's the highest frequency of the heterodyne band. And those are the exact ranges of frequency this thing isn't working. So what can we conclude so far? Okay, well, let's think about that a little bit more. So this is working. This is working. This is working. Now, this 5.4 gigahertz signal, it must be present because if it weren't present, there would be no way to create signals that are anywhere between 10 to 2 gigahertz. And we know that that signal is actually there. It's just not very stable. So we can fairly confidently say that the synthesizer 5.4 gigahertz is also working. It's just its output is not stable. Okay, what does that need to be have a stable output? Well, it needs a 100 megahertz reference. So there's a PLL in this entire section. It's just not shown in this block diagram. Now, since this is a 5.4 gigahertz synthesizer fixed, it's not that unusual that it will have a maybe only a couple of hundred megahertz of tuning range to begin with. And that is consistent with what we observe. In this entire chain, if this 5.4 gigahertz synthesizer is unlocked, that would explain exactly the symptom we are seeing. We can tune it between DC to 2 gigahertz, but it's just not stable. Since this we know is stable, it leaves only this one out. But let's take a look and see where that reference is from. Okay, so we have a 100 megahertz reference. Where's that coming from? Let's see, there is a block up here. There is an A6 reference board here, and that reference board is what's generating this 100 megahertz signal. If I can select this, here we go. So that's where this is coming from. Okay, so that's pretty useful to know that this 100 megahertz signal is one of the things we need to check. The other thing we need to check is, of course, this entire PLL, which is not shown in this diagram here, but there is, it's in there somewhere. This is a heavily simplified block diagram. So there could be a 100 megahertz problem. It could be a PLL around the 5.4 gigahertz problem. So we have to take a look at all of that. Now, is this 100 megahertz a likely cause? Well, not really, because if you look, we do have a 2 megahertz signal that's derived from this 100 megahertz signal through some dividers. How do I know this? Well, this 2 megahertz signal must be working because it's used here. And we know that this entire chain is working. 
So that leaves us with the fact that this 2 megahertz is there, this 1 megahertz is also there because it's going somewhere else, but this 100 megahertz signal could be suspect. So we're going to go ahead inside the instrument and check a couple of things. Now before we do that, we should take a look at a block diagram of A6 a little bit more closely. There we go. That's the block diagram of that entire synthesizer on the, the reference board. And here we can get some more detail. So here's the, where's our 100 megahertz signal? Here's our 100 megahertz signal that we're interested in. You can see it goes into the heterodyne band. But check this out. There is a divide by 10, and the 10 megahertz output on the rear panel of the instrument is derived from the 100 megahertz signal. So all I have to do is measure this 10 megahertz signal. And if that 10 megahertz signal is nice and stable, that means that this entire PLL is working. Now what this includes, there is a VCXO at 100 megahertz, there's the internal 10 megahertz reference, I don't have this option so it's not present, and there's an integrator which is just a PLL loop, okay? So that all makes sense. And there's further divisions to create these signals. Now again, I'm reasonably confident that this signal should be working because the 2 megahertz signal that we're using is actually there and it is correctly working. But nonetheless, let's go ahead and try this out. So first action, Measure the 10 megahertz in the rear panel, make sure it's there, and then we'll take it from there. Okay, so here's a 10 megahertz reference from the back. I'm going to connect it to a frequency counter. By the way, I did find a right size fan and installed it. It works quite nicely now. I'm going to turn the instrument on, and we'll take a look over there, and check it out. There is our 10 megahertz. So that pretty much confirms what I was saying, that the reference board is working, and all those frequencies should be correct. Now, we can look for the 5.4 gigahertz synthesizer so we can find that block but first I'm going to measure that 100 megahertz with the frequency counter too just to make sure it is working. So I first connected the 100 megahertz output to the frequency counter and it wasn't showing anything but then I connected it to the spectrum analyzer and check it out it is tiny the signal is really really small it's minus 60 dBm so no wonder nothing is working that signal is very very small so now we have an interesting problem on our hand because the signal at 100 MHz is clearly there so the synthesizer is locked and we should know this because the 10 MHz signal was working. So something else has gone wrong in that board. I think it's time to get this board out and take a look and see what kind of circuitry is on it. So here's a reference board. This is where the external reference comes in. This is where the external reference goes out. We know that that signal is working. And this is for the oven, which I don't have in this one. And this is interfacing, of course, to the main motherboard. Now, the 100 megahertz signal is generated somewhere underneath these cages. You can see the output is right there. So that's the one that's not working. And it's not surprising, again, that's under the cage because you really want to make sure that that part is clear. So the entire synthesizer at 100 megahertz and the divider so all must be in there. I got to take those off. And nothing too surprising under the cage, we have our 100 megahertz oscillator over there, which can be tuned a little bit in the PLL loop. We know that this is working because the 10 megahertz is of course working. And we do see a weak signal over here. Now I think there is a couple of amplification stages and splitters in there in order to feed the dividers as well as the output at the same time. So we can go ahead and probe this and find out which amplifier is connected to what. But you know, we have an x-ray machine. Let's just x-ray it. And here's our x-ray, and look how beautiful it is. The machine really does a very good job with these printed circuit board x-rays. So here's the connector that I was measuring the 100 megahertz from. By the way, the reason this is at, at 45 degrees is because it's a very long board. It doesn't quite fit in, inside of my x-ray machine. But the center pin of that goes over here. There's a DC block and a biasing resistor of this transistor, which is the final stage of the amplification. There's a couple more, and the signal, as I said, has to split into multiple places. There's a couple of other interesting features you can extract from this X-ray. First of all, you can see these numbers and the marking of the components. That's because they're not in silkscreen, so they're not in ink. They're actually in metal. They're using one of the metal layers. That's why they're blocking X-ray, so they're really visible. This also gives you an idea of how good the X-ray is, so you can read these the fine features so well. You can also see the turns of the inductors as well. You can see inside of this component, look at that, the little wire wound inside. Very cool. I think this is an inductor as well. Now, the other interesting feature is you can see the internal structures of these dip packages and the way the metals reach the different pins, but you can't see it in this one. That's because this is a ceramic package and it blocks the x-rays much more. It's a much more dense material. Same with this ferrite. You can see right through it. You cannot see the, the inner turns. And I'm using 26 kilovolts here for a nine second exposure. If I expose a little bit longer, you might be able to extract some more detail and see a little bit better, for example, through the ceramic package over here. But yeah, overall, I think it's a nice thing and we can follow these traces and I'm gonna go ahead and do that off camera to figure out what all the amplification stages are so we can replace whatever that could be gone bad. You can also blend the visible image and the x-ray together. I just did this very quickly. It's not even very well aligned, but I'm sure some good algorithms can be used to automatically align these like they do with infrared images and visible images. And that gives you some nice 
uh, feature. So basically you're looking through the board at the same time. You can see that the traces throughout all the layers. This can be very, very helpful to debugging and reverse engineering things. This component over here, that's actually a 5 volt voltage regulator, which you also cannot see through. And the oscillator there at 100 MHz is all the way down there. Well, it didn't take very long to find a faulty component. In fact, it was one of the amplification stages. So here's the transistor connected to this analyzer. And when I turn the analyzer on, in fact, we find that it doesn't even detect it. Yeah, it's, it's completely open on all of its terminals, which explains the behavior really quite well. Now, surprisingly, this was actually available on DigiKey. This is not by the same manufacturer. This is made by ST, but this is made by a different company. This is nothing more just than an RF transistor. This is an NPN 15 volt and it's a 1.4 gigahertz FT device. So running it at about 114th of its FT, which is perfectly reasonable. This S F max is not listed, but doesn't matter. I bought three of them. There's one of them. There you go. They were, I think, about five or six dollars each, which is not a problem. So we can put this one in the tester in exactly the same configuration as the other one just to show you that this indeed does get detected without any problems. Of course, it doesn't matter which node we connect to what. We just can't connect to the case. One of the pins is the case. Let me turn that on. And it should tell us that it is indeed an NPN. There you go. Okay, so it works. So let's go ahead and install this in its place. Okay, so the board is installed again. I'm connecting it once again to our signal spectrum analyzer. I'm going to go ahead and turn it on again. Let's take a look and check it out. Now, that's what I'm talking about. Here's a 100 megahertz signal. The amplitude is now just about minus 3 dBm. And once the instrument stabilizes, it becomes a little bit larger. There you go, minus uh, 1.97 dBm. Perfect. So I think it's okay. Now we can close the whole thing up. I just realized that I never actually showed the RF deck of this instrument, which is this portion over here from end to end. Here's the YIGs in there. They're underneath these two PCBs. Here's our heterodyne board. That's where the 5.8 or 5.4 gigahertz synthesizer was. I think this signal over here, that's where the 100 megahertz actually comes into this. Uh, we have the ALC as well as the output switch to the outside and the connector is in the front, just on the right side of this. Yeah, that's it. That's all the RF. The rest of it were those cars that you were looking at before. And check it out, of course, the unlock condition is gone and the unlevel doesn't show up. It is sweeping from 10 megahertz to 20 gigahertz. I also changed the SMA connector that someone had put in. This should be not an SMA, of course. Looks really good. Now the only thing you have to do is just connect the output to a spectrum analyzer, make sure that it looks good below 2 gigahertz, and we're done. Okay, I have the output of the instrument connected to the Rodenschwarz ZNL6 here. So I'm going to enable the output and here it is, 1 gigahertz. No problem, it doesn't hunt around anymore. It looks good. Let me go down in frequency. So here's 200 megahertz, and we can go all the way up. Here is 1.6, and here is 1.9, and at 2, it transitions to the other side. You can see the noise floor actually changes because there's much more noise in the heterodyne mode. You have uncorrelated noises from multiple sources, so it's not very good at lower frequencies. But anyway, when it goes higher, it's now doing what it used to do, but now it works perfectly well at the bottom one as well. So there you have it. I hope you enjoyed the repair of this instrument. There's a lot of effort that goes into these videos, as you can imagine, and I really am grateful to the Patreon supporters who make these things possible. These instruments, even when they're broken, they're still quite expensive to buy, and of course the time it takes to repair them. So thanks again for all that. Please do check the Patreon page if you do want to contribute. There's a bunch of information there as well that you might enjoy. As always, I'll see you in the comment section.